companies have been good at doing the things that are not very disruptive to their business model. If you're tired of arguing with strangers on the internet, try talking with one of them in real life. Welcome to Back in America, the podcast. I am Stan Bertolo and this is Back in America, a podcast exploring America's culture, values and identity. This episode is part of a series on positive initiatives to save our planet. In my last interview, I spoke with Nevi Raju about the frugal economy. Today, I am talking to Bruno Sarda, an internationally renowned expert in sustainability. For years, corporations have advertised their green initiative to reassure both investors and customers about their sustainable practices. Yet, as we know, climate change is only getting worse. So I want to ask Bruno, was it just greenwashing? Before we dive into this conversation, a personal note. Back in America now boasts more than 50 episodes. And I'm very grateful to you, my listener, for your support during all this time. This summer, I will be going back to France for the first time in two years, and I will take a podcast break until September. However, my interns, Josh and Emma, will be keeping the light on by releasing podcast episodes and newsletter articles. See this podcast note for subscribing. Josh has been working on a series of episodes discussing American music and poetry, which will be released every week in July and August. So, Back in America will be in summer mode, and I know that you will love it. Now, it is time for our interview. Hello, Bruno Sarda. Welcome to Back in America. Could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, uh, Bruno Sarda. Uh, uh, long, time, uh, long time in the U.S. and spent uh, the last uh, uh, 10 plus years now in the world of uh, social and environmental responsibility. Okay. So you are French-American, is that right? Yes. Okay. Well, Bruno, our planet is sick. We all know it, and we do nothing. Are we just going to watch our world fall apart? Hopefully not. Um, you know, I think we've known the problems we have for a long time. You know, certainly science has been at this for decades. Governments have known this for decades. Large companies have known this for decades. Uh, we are now seeing a significant change in attitude that will be followed hopefully by some more action, whether it's enough action fast enough is going to be part of our conversation, I'm sure. But I think there's a few things that have changed, including the, the fact that the, the, the world's basically capital markets and finance recognize that there is now a very systemic existential risk to future profitability and even viability of many systems if uh, unaddressed. You know, sustainability, the basic definition is the ability to sustain, uh, is can we keep doing what we're doing forever? You know, if you cut trees faster than they grow, at some point you run out. You know, if we spend money faster than we make it, at some point we run out. If we pull fish out of the sea faster than they could reproduce, at some point we run out. So this idea of can we keep doing things the same way without at some point running into uh, either a wall or a precipice uh, is, I think, the, the, the realization that certainly governments, but especially the, the private sector, capital markets, and, and frankly, corporations are realizing that their business models are now threatened, uh, not by this abstract uh, global concern, but by very real existential threats to their ability to continue uh, succeeding uh, in, their, um, in their business models. Well, I want to come back to that because you, you did spend quite a lot of time with large organizations. You've been the director of sustainability for many large companies, including Energy, Dell, uh, Charles Schwab. Uh, you've been named one of the most influential sustainability voices in America by The Guardian. And in 2017, you were chosen by environmental leader as one of the top 50 sustainability leaders in the U.S., 
Yet, after more than a decade of talk about sustainability, carbon emission is nowhere near what we need to curb climate change. Was it all greenwashing? Uh, I mean, there's certainly been a lot of greenwashing. There's also been a lot of, uh, you know, what I would call a, a, both an ambition gap and an action gap. The ambition gap is what is the difference between the stated ambition and the needed ambition. Uh, and I think that gap is closing rapidly. You see now the number of countries, cities, states, and frankly, uh, large organizations that are now making commitments to net zero emissions by 2050. So that's what we know needs to happen. Net zero by 2050 is what the science tells us we need to do. So the ambition gap is closing. The promise is that the action needs to follow because there are plenty of examples of organization having made firm commitments and then not following through. You know, about 10 years ago, a lot of companies uh, made some very significant commitments, for example, to halt deforestation, especially from the use of things like palm oil. Uh, it's called the New York Declaration on Forests. And 10 years later, uh, 2020 was the, was the kind of the key milestone. Almost all of them not only failed to meet, but failed to even get close. Do you have any example here? Any names? You know, I can't think of a single one just off the top of my head uh, to uh, to specifically point out, but uh, but it was the vast majority of, of the organizations that uh, that made that commitment. So you know, there was a lot to learn in terms of so what happened. You know, did they not mean it? Did they not mobilize the right resources to follow through on the commitment? Did they not track the right progress? You know, was there leakage in the system? Which you know, for sure, there is also some. Uh, in terms of illegal deforestation, those kinds of things. But um, I think most organizations are not in the business of trying to lie to the public about their environmental commitments, but most organizations also fail to match the level of commitment to the level of resource mobilization and capital deployment necessary to actually meet the stated ambition. So that's really now, we talk about this decade as the decade of action, is that words are no longer enough. You know, the only things we are going to measure is what are you doing at what scale and what are you measuring and how can we trust what is being measured relative to, you know, what we can believe. Well, give me some concrete example of things you see happening in the corporate world that make you hope. I mean... <laughs> Companies have been good at doing the things that are not very disruptive to their business model. For example, renewable energy. You know, a lot of the big tech companies, you know, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Dell, Intel, you know, a lot of the big users of electricity have done a great job of investing in um, transforming, you know, making commitments to 100% renewable energy. In fact, now you have, you know, uh, the number of companies that have committed to 100% renewable energy, this this group called the RE100, is um, you know represents more energy demand than all of the states' renewable energy portfolio standards combined. So it's you know well in excess of 200 terawatt hours of, of power a year. So that's a very significant commitment. And these companies have been deploying resources to actually purchase actually most of the most exciting renewable energy projects that have been happening have been led by corporations much more than governments. Having said that, for most of these companies, all it means is they're just buying electricity from somebody else, you know, to power their data centers, to power their operations. And in many cases, they're saving money doing it. Uh, you know, the early days, for example, Google was a very early player. So was Microsoft. At the time, they were paying a premium. So that was encouraging because they knew that that was needed to send strong market signals. But uh, now most, most companies that go into renewable energy purchase contracts are actually saving money doing that. So it's encouraging that actually the, the scale of adoption of renewable energy is, is growing rapidly, but it's also you know important to be objective that for these companies, it doesn't necessarily mean they're making some very fundamental difference to their business model. Um, where you see more encouraging signs is when companies are truly willing to challenge their own kind of core operations. When you look at some of what Unilever did in uh, 
farming practices and packaging practices and distribution practices, even the whole uh, articulation of building, um, you know, what they call their sustainable brands was very central to their core business as a, as a consumer packaged goods company. You see companies like Interface in the, in the you know, industrial carpets uh, uh, or, or companies like that that are fundamentally rethinking, reinventing, redesigning their core business processes, their core business, their core products, sometimes even their core markets. You know, in the case of uh, in the case of Interface, for example, they went from a, a very carbon intensive and waste heavy product, right? So it was very energy intensive and carbon intensive to produce it, and then a product that would basically clog up landfills, to basically a, a net zero footprint, actually carbon negative where now they use materials that actually are, uh, they, they absorb more carbon than they emit uh, through their life cycle. And they completely reinvented the business model. Actually, Interface basically invented the carpet tile uh, so that when they did commercial uh, installs, they could um, basically swap out the carpet tile. So they kind of completely closed the loop so they could re reuse, remake. Uh, so it's, a, it's almost like a zero waste model. So zero waste on the outset uh, and, and zero carbon on the, on the front end. So that's, that's a great example of a company that really looked at you know, how they impacted the world and made some very real changes. Um, and then their, their competitors followed. You see some of the other big carpeting companies, Mosaic and others ended up following suit. Uh, and that's the other part that can be exciting is when there's a bit of a race to the top as opposed to kind of a race to the bottom when it comes to, um, you know, race to the bottom would be kind of what is the least cost compliance. And then the race to the top is how can we outcompete each other in, in creating customer demand, creating, you know, innovative new products um, uh, to, to meet customer demand in some way. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned uh, Unilever also. Um, a few weeks ago, I was speaking with uh, Navy Raju, who is an expert in uh, uh, frugal economy and circular economy. And he was also mentioning uh, how Unilever has just released in the public domain their IP about, um, I think it was a production uh, of some kind of their product. Do, what do you think of people that prone circular economy? or frugal economy, as they like to call it. Is, is that feasible in a, in a capitalistic environment like the one uh, we have in, in the U.S.? I mean, it's, it's certainly feasible. It's not compatible with certain business models. So we as consumers, you know, and, and you know, we've known for years the, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. Recycle is the third, and, uh, you know, and these are, the right uh, order, right? Reduce is try to use less stuff. Uh, reuse is, you know, if you lose something, don't just throw it away when you're done with it. Can you make something other with it? Can you keep it? And then the recycle is, if you can't, then try to put it back in the chain. So the recycle is, of course, this idea of circularity. Uh, the frugal is more of this idea of reduce and to some extent reuse. So these are not new concepts. I think as consumers, it's become easier for us to um, to do that. And there's there's new interesting models that haven't really scaled yet, uh, partly because of the pandemic. I don't know if you've ever seen this uh, this model called Loop, which was actually pioneered by TerraCycle. That's just down the down the road for us in New Jersey, but uh, working with a lot of large brands where you could basically order anything from your shampoo to uh, your haagen ice cream, to all kinds of products, your Tide detergent in actually a reusable container. So it's basically a subscription model where the, you buy the container, but then basically um, there's a special model uh, through e-commerce where they uh, basically refill it. So you just use the product, but the container, the, the, the packaging stays with you. Um, do you use that yourself? Uh, you know, they, they still kind of had it as a pilot stage and it hasn't, uh, it hasn't rolled out at scale yet. Um, you know, I always try to find whether it's, you know, if you do take out in a restaurant, it's like, don't give me a bunch of packaging. Just give, you know, let me bring my own container. Let me bring my own uh, uh, bowl or something. Uh, you know, sometimes regulations get in the way of that. So, um, 
the, the question is in this kind of conspicuous consumption model, can companies do okay in this idea of the frugal or circular economy? Um, you know, you see brands like Patagonia, even like Levi's, for example, in apparel have really tried to make that work uh, by saying, you know, we'll make things that are better, more durable and more expensive. So we don't need to sell you something as often. And they will even fix your product for free. Sure. And you see that, uh, you see that in, in now in uh, uh, some European countries, actually, the, this whole concept of the right to repair or even to some extent the obligation to repair. I mean, we all know, you know, if our vacuum cleaner or our microwave oven breaks, it's cheaper to replace it than to repair it. Uh, and I think this idea of build for build for recycling or build for repair was a big focus when I was at Dell, for example. We worked very closely with recyclers to understand the economics of repair and recycling, because even though many things are recyclable, many things are not recycled because nobody can make money doing so. Um, and, you know, for example, on a computer, if it's going to take... 45 minutes of skilled labor to take a computer apart, the economics don't work. If it can take five minutes of low skill labor to take a computer apart, then, you know, the cost you've spent on labor is small enough that uh, uh, you can make money from the parts that you've pulled, uh, you've pulled out. So we would bring recyclers into the design room to help us understand, you know, what does it take to make a, uh, a product that can be disassembled rapidly by a relatively low skilled employee um, so as to bring the economics in place. So a lot of people have been thinking about this. I think the circular model can work, but it has to, it has to also take into account equity and, and you know, this idea of circular procurement. You have to really rethink your entire supply chain model when you really approach circularity, not just the the post-consumption, but really the pre-consumption. It has to it has to truly really be designed as a loop. You know, we live in a society where citizens are consumer, where consuming is the only way to grow. How can we actually switch to a better model for the planet? I mean, does that mean the end of capitalism? Uh, I feel that in this country, in the US, when you say the end of capitalism, you just said a swear word, <laughs> right? It's, it's not something people want to hear. I mean, I think the, what capitalism has become is definitely a problem. This, this forever growth mentality, this actually exponential growth mentality that most stock valuations now in the market, uh, stock market, over 80% of the value of most securities is actually predicated on future earnings, not current earnings. Um, you know, some of the companies that are now, you know, turning out huge profits, you know, 10, $15 billion a quarter. If they said, you know, like we've won capitalism, like we we're, we're doing so well, we're going to do that forever. Like we will not grow our earnings. We're just going to deliver this level of profitability forever like their stock would go into a tailspin. The idea that they would stop growing is uh, today considered unacceptable. Now that in itself isn't necessarily what capitalism requires. Capitalism talks about, you know, how do you align with society's growth pattern uh, in terms of providing employment for future generations? You know, we've gone from about you know, a billion people to about 7 billion people in just one century. You know, we've been around for dozens of centuries, but uh, just in the last one, you know, we've, we've grown our population exponentially. We've grown jobs exponentially. We've grown production consumption exponentially. You know, one of the, one of the hardest challenges of the work in sustainability is how do you decouple this idea of financial growth uh, with consumption and resource use, uh, can you, uh, you know, can you decouple? In some cases, maybe it's possible. In many cases, at some point, it's not. So we need to really rethink, uh, you know, protein is a good example. You know, it, it, the amount of resource it takes to produce, for example, one pound of beef uh, or a calorie equivalent of beef is about 18 times what it takes to produce a calorie equivalent of plants. Uh, so in terms of land use, in terms of water, in terms of uh, um, carbon, 
Uh, and so, you know, we have to look at how do we how do we make what we make, uh, how do we consume what we make, uh, and and what do we need to change at the right level of scale to ensure not just continuity but a certain again uh, equity and ultimately uh, a certain amount of resiliency. And do you think uh, we are heading in the right direction? What do you think, Bruno? I mean, I think we're. We're improving every day. We're not improving nearly fast enough or big enough. Uh, I think right now there's still a certain amount of complacency from on the part of most businesses that you know they're doing better and they feel good about doing better. But better in most cases is nowhere near good enough. Um, you know, there's some realization now. I think on the greenhouse gas front, right? So on the climate impact front, that you see again all these zero. Uh, carbon commitments, these science-based targets where businesses have agreed to align their ambition with what science demands. So it's no longer saying, well, here's what we can do, but rather starting from here's what we need to do. So I think on greenhouse gas emissions, there's there's progress. Uh, on, on almost everything else, there isn't, um, whether it's water, whether it's forest products, whether it's uh, extraction of all sorts, whether it's on plastics, um, it's still not informed by what needs to happen and much more informed by what companies feel they can do without incurring, um, you know, significant disruption or cost to their business model. So, you know, the, at some point, I think we're headed for um, crisis. We've seen this in, in pandemic, you know, all the things we didn't do to prepare, you know, you have to spend trillions of dollars after as opposed to maybe billions of dollars before uh you know the old saying right a, a pound of no, what is it a an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure i think we're going to keep learning that lesson over and over in in environmental degradation i think we're going to see a lot of people suffer from uh displacement from things like sea level rise i think we're going to see a lot of coastal communities and poor countries very significantly impacted by um, collapsing fisheries uh, i think we're going to see lots of communities impacted by uh changing nature of agriculture you know um, even now we see it that the, the changing climate uh will move the optimal um growing patterns of certain crops by hundreds of miles north You know, in Bordeaux, they talk about maybe the, the good wines of the future will be grown in Scotland, you know. Uh, and, wow. uh, and when you look at coffee, when you look at potatoes, you know, I talk to companies that buy enormous amounts of potatoes. Uh, they say, you know, 10, 15 years from now, the, 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 the key areas of the world where they want to grow and buy their potatoes may not be the ones where they do now. So what does that mean for those communities now that you know, have such a reliance on those key crops. So I think, I think we're going to see a lot of disruption. And I think we're going to see, as has often happened in history, the most vulnerable people suffer the most. Hmm. And talking about climate change is political, yet its impact, as we just saw, uh, affect people on both sides of the aisles. What will it take to get everybody on board? I mean, we saw how divided this country is uh, after you know, four years of Trump, we see that Biden is, you know, uh, raising climate change uh, as, you know, sort of his uh, platform uh, message. And yet we know that a lot of people are not on board with that and see that as really a political statement. You were, I read an article where you said, we know what to do. We just need a leader. Do we have that leader? Is Biden that leader? Can the U.S. be trusted? Hmm, lots of questions in there. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a shame that this ever became a political issue. That happened for two main reasons. One is because, the, frankly, the fossil fuel industry, especially the oil and gas industry, you know, used their very large amounts of money to buy themselves political air cover decades ago. To, uh, to make sure that at least one side of the political aisle was going to have their back. Um, and, you know, and there's plenty of evidence that they, you know, back going back to the, to the 1970s, they already knew what climate change was going to be. 
and that their product and the consumption of their product was going to be a huge contributor. So, you know, there's a good uh, documentary called Merchants of Doubt that uh, I would recommend that explains actually how different industries over time, uh, from tobacco to oil and others, have uh, have used very similar techniques to uh, to create political air cover for inaction, including by this idea of seeding doubt. Um, the other thing that's very unfortunate, frankly, is how Al Gore tried to become the poster child for climate change right around the time when he had lost a, a very contentious uh, election. And, um, and you know, this, this period that started uh, about 20 years ago that really started sowing the division uh, between the political parties that it became that if you supported climate change, you supported Al Gore, and then if you didn't, you didn't. So I think that was extremely unfortunate because uh, it, it politicized it in a way that it didn't uh, need to be. And um, and I think, you know, Al Gore really meant a lot of the things he was trying to do at the time. But um, in hindsight, uh, having a, a very partisan political leader try to be, you know, the strongest advocate for that topic uh, was not useful to the cause. Um, I think what happens now, my hope and what I'm seeing, certainly, I mentioned it at the beginning of our conversation, is that there's a significant mobilization on the part of money, capital markets, um, you know, the entire financial system. It's, I mean, it's not that whether or not they believe in climate change, you know, it's just like you don't believe in cancer or like climate change is what it is. You know, I don't care what you believe. It, it, is, a, it is a fact. It is an ailment uh, of our planet and it needs attention. But because it is actually significantly risky to, uh, to financial flows, to financial returns, to uh, corporate stability, that uh, those, who, those who will support political inaction are fewer and fewer. Um, and, uh, and to some extent, even the oil and gas companies that are you know, owned by these large financial giants like BlackRock and Vanguard and others, you know, these companies are now losing patient with uh, the oil and gas majors uh, who, who will not, um, you know, make transition plans. And in fact, you're seeing this just in the last few weeks with shareholder votes, uh, you know, compelling these companies. Uh, so their owners, their shareholders telling them you will basically figure out and, and publish a, uh, a transition pathway to, uh, to net zero. So uh, I think, you know, climate change is, is going to continue to be, I think, for some in the political arena, a wedge issue. But um, for the most part, I think the political support for, uh, or at least the financial support for these politicians is going gonna, is gonna to quickly evaporate. And at some point, um, they, uh, this will no longer be as wedge issue, but that doesn't mean they will do something meaningful either. So that goes to your last question. Can the U.S. be trusted? At this point, if I were any other country, I would, you know, I would be very wary that whatever Biden says or Biden does now may change next time he does something or if he commits to Paris, but then, the, you know, the Senate never ratifies any treaty or doesn't appropriate funds to, uh, to, you know, to fund the work that the U.S. has committed to, the U.S. political system is in that way very, uh, very broken. Hmm. We are getting at the end of the interview, and I, I have two questions for you. Um, are you still a teacher? I am. A professor? Am. So you, you, you see a lot of young people, and I know that... Um, for many of them, the idea of having kid, kids, children, is almost unethical. What do you say to that? You know, I don't know that they necessarily come to me for advice on that topic. Uh, I, I tend to reject uh, on on the pure kind of moral basis, those who, who say that the basically population is our biggest problem. Um, we have plenty, plenty of resources to, for everybody on this planet to live well and abundantly in ways that are in harmony with nature. That is not how we do it today. But the, our problem is that is not that this planet's carrying capacity is only 
whatever number of billion people, uh, uh, and 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 is is a smaller amount than what we have today. The the problem we have is how we exist on this planet as a people, uh, regardless of how many of us. And in fact, all you see all the data that the the top one percent of the world's population accounts for 30, 40 percent of the of the impact. Actually, the you know the bottom 80 percent of the world's population has a tiny, tiny impact on the Earth, both in terms of resource use and, and impact on climate change. So it's not about the number of people; it's about how we exist on this planet. So, you know, certainly, I don't think anybody should feel compelled to uh, to to procreate, uh, uh, you know, for the good of society, as maybe they were once told, but um, but to not necessarily also guilt themselves into thinking that bringing another human being into the world is somehow unethical or or or, or detrimental because that's that's i think the, a false premise for me thank you thank you and finally what is america to you uh america is plenty of things to me um you know, it's my home. Uh, it's where I've chosen to live for the last, you know, 30 plus years. It's actually, you know, even though I was born and raised in France, uh, my mother originally, actually her mother was a uh, long time American, but uh, uh, hardly spent any of her life living in the U.S. But I have ancestry going back to the 1600s and uh, in the U.S. early settlers to, uh, to Virginia. Uh, uh, so I have Part of me, it feels like I've been here a long time, and then part of me feels like I just got here. Um, you know, I love this country for many things, and there's plenty of this, things in this country that I uh, that I would like to see different. Uh, um, and uh, it's such as it, you know, I'm uh, uh, I could never get used to uh, some of the things that growing up in a different part of the world you just can't get to. I think the gun culture for sure for me is is one that I absolutely cannot get used to. And that for, for all, again, the, the evidence, I'm very much about facts and evidence that uh, that gun control works. Everywhere it's been tried, it works. And, and it leads to less violence, uh, both in the streets and in the home. Um, and that why some people just would hang on to a few sentences written by a handful of guys, you know, 250 years ago as the only premise for why they should now, you know, be allowed to carry weapons of war around in their neighborhoods. Just like, I can't understand that. Um, and uh, uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of generosity and, and, and beauty of spirit in the American people, but there's also at times a, uh, I think a certain myopia uh, and lack of awareness and understanding. It's it's sad that you know less than ten percent of the population of this country even has a passport. I'd love for, you know more people to kind of explore the world and, and value other cultures, uh, uh, and uh, and that's part of what we do is we try to bring kind of what we know uh, from our cultures and and embrace all of what America gives us and try to bring, give something back from what we've seen along our our travels. Good. Excellent. Bruno Sala, thank you so much. Thank you, Stan. Thank you for listening to this episode. Are you a subscriber to the free Back in America newsletter on Substack? In each episode, we explore topics covered in the podcast and dive deeper into the question that can fit into our episodes. In recent stories, intern Emma Mayer shared her experience about the underprivileged population and the COVID vaccine hesitancy. Josh revisited the MOVE bombing in Philadelphia, and I recently touched base with Gilles Lopez, whom I previously interviewed and looked at how urban communities become resilient. Check out the episode's note for a link to the newsletter. Thank you, and have a great day.